Pastor Keith here welcoming you to uh, this celebration of Maundy Thursday, the Thursday on Holy Week. We are here in the sanctuary, the empty sanctuary, uh, to celebrate uh, uh, online uh, as a way of dealing with the uh, coronavirus. We're glad that you're part of this service. As we begin, I'd like to invite you to join me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do give you thanks for the presence of our friends and neighbors. Uh, we are spread out right now, but our hearts are united together. We pray that you will bless us in this service by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we may be drawn even closer together and closer to you. We ask it in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. The services that we've had during Holy Week have all been designed to remind us of the events of Jesus' life on that last week before He was crucified. It's Thursday now. There are two events that happened on Thursday that are especially important to us. We'll be lifting both of those up tonight to remember. The first of those is the foot washing, as Jesus uh, took care to teach His disciples the importance of service. The second of those is that this is the time that he initiated Holy Communion. And again, we'll be remembering that. We are glad that you're here and you will have an opportunity to participate as we lift up uh, a remembrance of the foot washing and a special celebration that is not Holy Communion, but will be a love feast. For the foot washing, if you would like to participate in that, we want to let you know uh, you'll need a, a basin or uh, some sort of a, a tub of water, uh, a, a pitcher of water, and a towel to dry your feet. Uh, if you uh, want to participate in the love feast, there will be some eating that goes on, and so we invite you to uh, go get uh, maybe a piece of bread or some other pastry uh, and uh, something to drink. Water is always good. As we go through this service, you'll see that uh, Pastors David and Reggie and Severio and I all are in different places. We are observing social distancing, and uh, we're glad that you're part of this as you observe the same. So uh, you'll be looking at us in other parts of the church or even in our homes as we move through the different parts of the service. Again, we are so glad that you're here. Sometimes you fall and fall. 
Hi, this is Reggie Clemens, Executive Pastor here at First Methodist Pearland. Our scripture reading comes from John 13, 1 through 11. The public teaching of Jesus has been completed, and Jesus now focuses exclusively on teaching his own, his disciples, and trying to prepare them for what is to come. He makes a statement that he loved them to the end, which is striking. The end, telos in Greek, could mean end in the sense of conclusion or termination. But it could also mean end in the sense of goal or aim or fulfillment. Now, given John's fondness for ambiguity and multiple layers of meaning, perhaps both meanings are intended. Jesus loved his disciples to the very end of his earthly life and ministry, and he loved them fully and completely without condition or reservation, for this was the fulfillment of his mission. Jesus knows that his hour has come to depart from this world and to return to the Father. He knows that the Father has given all things into his hands. And he knows that he has come from God and he is going back to God. And knowing all this, he chooses to demonstrate his love for his disciples in a dramatic way by taking the role of a slave and washing their feet. John 13, 1 through 11, and I'm reading from the New International Version. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not everyone was clean. This is the word of God for the people of God. Hey everybody, Pastor David here with all the rest of the Grand family, and we are going to do a, a foot washing with you. And like Pastor Key said, what you're going to need is, is a bowl. Any bowl will do. A pitcher of water. Any pitcher of water will do. Some towels and um, some dirty feet. And we've got some dirty feet, right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. All right, so uh, the first thing, though, is why do we do foot washings? And I know that um, it's a passage of Scripture we're reading, but there's also a great uh, kind of background on it in our favorite Bible, the Jesus Storybook Bible, right here. And um, Jesse is going to read it for you guys so you kind of know the background. It was Passover, a time when God's people remembered how God had rescued them from being slaves in Egypt. Every year they killed a lamb and ate it. The lamb died instead of us, they would say. But this Passover, God was getting ready for an even greater rescue. Jesus and his friends were having Passover meal. 
meal together in an upstairs room. But Jesus' friends were arguing. What about? They were arguing about stinky feet. Stinky feet? Yes, that's right. Stinky feet. Now, the thing about feet back then was the people didn't wear shoes. They only wore sandals, which might not sound unusual, except that the streets in those days were dirty. And I don't mean just dirty. I mean really stinky dirty. With all those cows and horses everywhere, you can imagine the stuff that was on the street that ended up on your feet. So anyway, someone had to wash away the dirt, but it was a dreadful job. Who on earth would ever dream of volunteering to do it? Only the lowliest servant. And yes, thank you, Jesse. And what I love about this is it was about stinky feet. And his face shows stinky feet. And then it shows all the kinds of things that people back in those days could have stepped in. So we made sure to get some stinky feet happening. And if mommy, can you show everybody some of the stinky feet that's happening? And you know, if you guys want to go out into your backyard or step out into the front yard and you find some gifts left, you know, you can step in those, uh, whatever. That's what was in the book. But the idea is that the servant came to serve the, the other people that, that were there. And so what Jesus is doing is showing us that here we are to serve those, to serve other people, and especially to serve those that we love. And we get to experience that in a special way. So what we're going to do is I'm going to wash the feet of one person and then another, and I'm going to just say a quick little blessing and prayer over them. And you guys can kind of watch this first one and then pause it and do it yourselves or just kind of keep doing it uh, as we go to. It's up to you, but I'm going to go ahead and wash uh, a foot now. All right, dear. So if you can put your feet right here, put your feet out there. Thank you. Let me just get one for now. All right, ready? Get all that off. And I can use my hands. And Jer, now I can just say, I love being your dad. Jeremiah, you're a blessing to me, and it is my honor to serve you.
My name is Thea, and I serve as the family pastor at FUMC Pearland and Redeemer Church. One of the great aspects about Maundy Thursday is the remembrance of Jesus' great service and love that he poured out to the crowds and to his disciples directly. With teaching and healing and even foot washing, Jesus' compassion is really evident. And today, that love and direction and service is still poured out unto us. Would you join me in a prayer of gratitude? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your immense compassion and service, leadership and direction that is poured out to us. God, it is because of your gracious spirit that we are called to follow you, that you give us all we need and you provide for our every need. Lord, we are thankful to come together in this time to give you thanks for our families, for our homes, for unique ways to connect, and for the opportunity to be in real relationship with you. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and we lean in to learn more on how we might love others the way that you have loved. God, we thank you again for this time and all the ways that you pour out to us. It is in your heavenly and gracious name we pray. Amen. In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you. I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me your vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you. Have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil. breaking a new ground. You are breaking a new ground. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. Oh, my old flame.
vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring a new wine out of me. I'm going to read to you a passage from Matthew 26. And this is Matthew's account of the Last Supper. One thing to keep in mind is that this is the feast of the Passover, which meant that Jesus and his disciples had celebrated this all their lives. This time, however, was unique. And this is what what Matthew tells us that Jesus does. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit or from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you and my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Well, we've moved from the sanctuary into the prayer room to share in the love feast. Today is called Maundy Thursday. That is a strange name. Uh, Maundy actually comes from the Latin word for mandate. And it's called that because it was at the Last Supper that Jesus gave his disciples a mandate. He said, I want you to remember this meal. I want you to celebrate it again. I want you to remember it forever, which is what we do every time we share in Holy Communion. But tonight, we're not going to be able to share in Holy Communion. But we are going to share in a love feast. Now, it's important to know that these are not the same thing. When we uh, share in the Lord's Supper in Holy Communion or the Eucharist, uh, we're going all the way back to that uh, Last Supper with Jesus and the disciples. Uh, We are celebrating what He celebrated. And uh, we believe that uh, when the pastor offers the prayer of consecration, that God's Holy Spirit does come into the uh, the bread and the cup uh, and into the hearts of all of the folks in the congregation in a, uh, in a way that we don't fully understand, but we believe to be true. So we are not celebrating Holy Communion tonight, but we are going to share in the Love Feast. The Love Feast is uh, an event that began in the early years of the church. And over the centuries, it has kind of faded in and out of popularity. It was very popular in the colonial days of the U.S. And uh, even in the 20th century, and even now, it's still popular among discipleship groups. Uh, It is a way of sharing in, uh, although it's not a sacramental meal, it is a a meal that uh, groups can share together uh, in the name of of the Lord Jesus. So tonight is very appropriate for us to be sharing in this love feast. The important parts of the love feast are that we share together in a, a, a small kind of a meal uh, and also get to share testimonies. I want to say that because uh, If you are gathered together with uh, a couple of uh, other folks, maybe in your family or folks that live with you uh, for this love feast, uh, it's an appropriate time uh, after we're finished tonight to uh, maybe spend some time sharing what the Lord has done uh, in your life. And if you've been uh, blessed in a special way, this is a great time to share that with the folks around you. Even if you're by yourself, It is great for us to be able to stop and just to think through the ways that the Lord has blessed us, maybe to offer a prayer of thanksgiving for all that God has done for us. The Love Feast is a great time to do that.
Testimonies are an important part of it. Now, also, uh, Scripture is an important part of a love feast, and uh, uh, after we're through, you may want to go through and uh, find your favorite Scripture, or again, if there are others there, uh, let each person share their favorite Scripture. I want to read a, a passage uh, that uh, is most appropriate for a love feast. It is the love chapter out of 1 Corinthians. Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see as in a mirror dimly. But then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, and a love, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord for which we give thanks. Another part of the love feast that is most important and again, you can do this in addition to what we do now. You can do more of this after we're through. It's prayer. We're going to pause for a moment. We're going to shift back into the sanctuary, and we will hear the Lord's Prayer sung for us.
what a blessing it is to have uh, talented musicians who can lead us and turn our hearts in the direction of the Lord. Well, if prayer and scripture and testimonies are all important parts of a love feast, certainly the eating is too. Now, it's okay to share almost anything at a love feast, uh, any kind of food, uh, bread is good, but, but again, we want to be sure we don't confuse this with communion because it is not communion. And so uh, if you've got uh, a loaf of bread, uh, that's, that's not a problem, but uh, I want to give you the freedom to, to reach out to find maybe something else. Uh, uh, again, a pastry might be, uh, might be something good. The first time I had uh, a, a long experience with Love Feast was on a, uh, a choir tour uh, years and years ago. And uh, we were singing some old Wesleyan hymns going uh, from place to place. And uh, a part of our service each night was to share a Love Feast. And we r wondered what would be the best thing to do. And we kind of uh, uh, accidentally came upon the idea of donut holes. Uh, and you know what? It was perfect. So for this service, I've got some donut holes here. And uh, it's just myself. I'm not going to eat them all. But uh, uh, when, you, uh, when you have a moment in, uh, in just a moment uh, to, uh, to share, uh, please feel free to, uh, to exchange this, uh, this meal uh, with uh, whoever may be there with you. And, uh, and it, again, if you're there with just you and the Lord, well, that's a great love feast as well. So let's now take uh, a moment to just uh, share the meal that we have. Uh, the drink, again, can be anything. Water is always great. Well, again, we want to thank you for being part of this Maundy Thursday observance, even if it was totally unlike any other Maundy Thursday we've ever celebrated. Still, it was an opportunity for us to draw close to the Lord and to be touched by the Holy Spirit. We mentioned that there were two important things that Jesus did on Thursday night that he had taught his disciples uh, through the foot washing the value of service. And then the second, of course, was the establishment of the Lord's Supper and the sacrament that we normally celebrate on Maundy Thursday. But he actually did a third thing that night. After the, the supper, after the foot washing, Jesus went out to the garden and prayed. Jesus went out into the world to prepare himself for what was to happen the next day. And so would you join me and let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us tonight and what we will remember that you do tomorrow and what you will do for us for the rest of our lives. Help us to honor you by following you. Help us to bring others to know you and to follow you. And Lord, by your power, may we change the world to your honor and glory. Amen.